All right. You know, the, yeah, I got to talk just for a minute about the CNN story because it's so absurd. It is so absurd. Everybody, everybody picked up the story. Lanny Davis fed them a story, possibly because he was running a GoFundMe campaign to pay his bills, to pay his fees for Michael Cohen. And so he slipped them the story as an anonymous source saying that Donald Trump, Michael Cohen had evidence that Donald Trump knew about this stupid Trump Tower meeting, which I'm sorry, but I cannot get excited about this Trump Tower meeting. This is the meeting Don Jr. had with the Russian lawyer. She said she had some dirt on Hillary Clinton. Don Jr. probably didn't know enough to know that that might be illegal. It might not be the right thing to do. So he goes to the meeting. Turns out the woman is just pushing uh, to get some relief on the what's it called? The Magnitsky Act or something, which is a, bothers Putin and his pals because it keeps their money from flowing freely in the uh, in the West, which is how they rip off their, their own country. It, by the time the meeting was five minutes in, Don Jr. is on his cell phone texting. Finally, he left. Nothing goes on. This is a big deal because this proves that somehow that there was collusion with Russia. And it's to me, the whole story is kind of ridiculous. The whole story has just gotten absurd. They have run this thing into the ground. But Lanny Davis slips him this note saying his client had evidence that Trump knew about this meeting before it took place, which Trump says he didn't. But that problem was his client had already testified under oath that he didn't. So now Lonnie Davis has revealed that he was the source. CNN not only used him as an anonymous source, but also let him say uh, no comment on the story as an official source, which is truly dishonest, truly uh, unrepresent, uh, unrepresentative of what they should be doing. Why are they doing this? So I have talked about this a lot, but it's worth going back to this whole idea of crisis in your imagination. You know, your imagination is where almost everything that matters in life takes place. When I use the word imagination, this is what I mean. I'm using it the way the old romantic poets used to use the word. I'm not just mean when you sit around fantasizing about something. Your imagination, obviously, the most important thing is your health, that you're well, that you're going to continue to live. But, but after that, everything that matters, beauty, truth, love, delight, joy, they all take place in your mind. Those are not things that exist outside yourself. They're an intermingling of your mind and reality. And what the media is trying to do is they're trying to colonize your imagination with a state of crisis. They want you to think there's a state of crisis all the time. And they do this, they do this not so that, e not because they want each story to stick or they expect each story to stick. They don't care if they have to retract stories. They don't care if you, they just forget about them. First of all, they know that you hit the crisis story a thousand times where the correction story gets hit twice. So they know that they're getting some play out of this. But eventually, eventually, there will be a crisis. Eventually, something will happen. This is the world, right? There are wars, there are explosions, there are uh, dips in the economy. All those things happen in the course of eight years, in the course of a presidency, a normal presidency. All these things happen. There may be a scandal in the Trump administration. Most administrations have scandals, except the Obama administration. It had scandals, but no one covered them. So they weren't there. They were invisible. But but for the rest of us, when we're covering when they're covering the presidency, there's going to be a scandal. And then and then the crisis, the crisis of the imagination pays off for the opponents of Republicans. This only happens during Republican administrations, really. Then it pays off because then they say, see, there's a crisis. We've been telling you all this time there was a crisis and there it is. And then you have to admit, you know what? They've got a point. They did this to Nixon. It was how they hounded him out of office on what was really minor stuff. I mean, compared to things that like Clinton and Obama did, it was really minor stuff. But by the time they caught him dead to rights on stupid things he shouldn't have done, they had created such a sense of corruption and terror and horror going on that, you know, people then lost faith in the present. That's what they're waiting for. That is what they are selling you every minute of every single day. No matter what is happening, that's the crisis. And you know who it's, it affects most? Who is on? We are always talking about the echo chamber, but who's on the echo chamber? I am. Ben is, Knowles is, Rush Limbaugh is. We're the people who pay attention all the time. And it's us, it's we who have to say, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, is, is this a state of crisis? Is America in a state of crisis? I mean, look, Trump loves chaos. He creates chaos. He says things all the time that make him seem ridiculous and that's, that cause chaos. But the country is doing well. The country's doing well. We're not at war. The economy is doing great. The economy is doing great. 
And yet, and yet, if you visit like the netherworld, the imaginary world of, say, the New York Times, you will see the crisis playing out in screaming headlines every single day. Every story on the front page of the New York Times is crisis, is meant to create a crisis of the imagination so that when the real crisis comes, then the go to war headlines come out. Like Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen. Oh, my God, it's hell week. Remember, they all said this hell week for the president. It was a hell week. Did Paul, you know, did Paul Manafort, anything he got convicted in, have anything to do with Trump? Did Michael Cohen saying he paid off Stormy Daniels really constitute, what are they, what are they using now? They're using this phrase, oh, he's an unindicted co-conspirator. No, he's not. No, he's not. You know, I mean, it's like they don't even have a, have on a crime if he was contributing money to this. So, you know, it's hell week. It's hell week. It doesn't matter if they have to retract it. It doesn't matter if it goes away. The point is, one day there'll be a crisis, and that's the moment when they will say, oh, man, oh, man, it's that, it's the, what, what did they call it uh, uh, under uh, Bush? The culture of corruption. The culture of corruption. That worked. That worked for an entire midterm to blow out uh, Trump, uh, Bush's support. They're hoping it'll work again in these midterms. You know, I just have to play this one guy, uh, Target, or as we call it, Target. Does everybody, <laughs> Target CEO Brian Cornell has just dumped billions of dollars into his stores. Why? Here he is on CNBC explaining why. This is the crisis in America. This is, remember, it's a big crisis, so don't forget to vote. <laughs> it's a big crisis. Here is the guy who runs Target about why he's spending on his stores. It's a very healthy consumer environment. I've been doing this for a long time. I think this is the healthiest environment I've ever seen. But importantly for us, we're building market share in virtually every category. Who are you stealing from? Well, I think we're picking up more footsteps when we see traffic up 6.4% and stores growing at almost 5%. Becky, it was almost yesterday. People were saying, you know, stores are dead. Right. No one's going to invest in stores. I remember back in February of 2017 when we announced we were going to spend $7 billion of capital over three years and take a billion dollars of operating income and invest in our team, our brands, in providing more value, people looked at us and said, why are you investing the in stores? The street didn't like that at first. They didn't. Yeah. I actually remember, um, it was February 28th of 2017. We were just talking and about that with the analysts, too. When we pushed the uh, announcement across the wire, and I watched you and Joe on set, and you looked at it and said, $7 billion of capital in stores? A billion dollars in wages and training and development in the brands? There must be a typo here. <laughs> because he's talking about consumers now, right? He's building stores cons consumers want to buy. Why? Because they have money. Why? Because the economy is doing great. You want to know about a crisis? Look at Venezuela. In a city, here's from the AP, in a city once called the Saudi Arabia Venezuela for its vast oil wealth, residents of Maracaibo now line up to buy spoiled meat as refrigerators fail amid nine months of rolling power outages that recently got worse. Socialist President Nicolas Maduro blames the strife on an economic war waged by the United States and other capitalist powers. That's the problem. The problem is socialism. That's a crisis. That is what a crisis looks like. This is you know, where does the crisis exist? It exists in the imagination of the press. I have to play this. Tiger Woods, golfer, right? Guy hits a ball with a stick. That's his job. He finishes a tournament. They ask him about Donald Trump, who he pals around with. Here's his response. He's the president of the United States, and you have to respect the, the, the office. And no matter who's in the office, um, you may like, dislike um, the personality or the, the politics. Uh, but we all must respect the office. Do you have anything more broadly to say about the state, I guess, the discourse of race relations? Um, no, I just finished 72 holes and really hungry. He finished 72 holes, he's really hungry, he doesn't want to talk politics, he hits a ball with a stick for a living, he has nothing to say about this, he has no reason he should say anything. Here is ESPN, which you turn on, I know, for the sports scores, here is ESPN reacting to Tiger's statement. Tiger, be clear. Are you saying that the office therefore confers respect onto its occupant, its present temporary occupant? No. What the, what the, having respect for the office means, principally, in my view, is the office holder should have respect for the office. Well, we we are all that. set to a standard. We're held to a standard of behavior. We at our jobs, right, people in their, in their daily lives, mm -hmm. 
The president, if anything, is held to a higher standard of behavior. It is not such that we have such great respect for the office that no matter what the behavior of its occupant, we must therefore respect its occupant because of the office. No, Tiger Woods is being, is, you said being slick. Here he's being slick. We must respect the office, therefore that confers respect to the occupant. Tiger, is that what you're saying? If that's what you're saying, that is a stupid comment. I don't, be, but I, I don't even know if he believes that that's what he's well, saying. First of all, we don't know what Tiger Woods believes. He's Campbellian Asian. He's not black. R E S P I C T. <laughs> yeah, pay some respect to Tiger Woods. That was a sports program. There is a crisis going on in the heads of these people. And what it really is, you know, that Lance Morrow, a think tank guy, wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal to give him credit. I can't read. I don't have time to read what he said. But basically, this is a holdover from the baby boomers. Hillary Clinton. Clinton's a baby boomer. Trump is a baby boomer. All these people are, react, are living in the world created by the baby boomers who basically thought we were fighting for our lives because they had to make some kind of heroism. They had to give their generation some kind of heroism because their parents had fought the Depression and World War II. And so they turned everything into a major crisis and they overturned two presidents, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. And they keep up this crisis mentality. Ain't no crisis. There is not a crisis in this country. It is, uh, we have a noisy, obstreperous president who is repellent to some, but is also doing a great job. He is doing a good job as president. That is his job. You don't have to like him, but his job as president, he is doing a good job. He's a big character with big flaws, but this is not a crisis of democracy. They are doing this. So when the crisis comes, when the crisis comes, it will be like Tinder and the crisis like the spark that will set your brain on fire. Don't let it happen. And by the way, if you really want to keep the crisis from happening, go out and vote come November and make sure you vote for the local Republican in your district so we don't have to go through a million impeachment proceedings and investigations.